he came up to me and he put his arms around me and he kissed me on the neck and whispered in my ear, you sure are a good looking gal, Kay. And all of a sudden there arose in me just a, a desire, you know, for this man. And here is a man that I've gone to for counseling. I um, left my husband, uh, I shook my fist in the face of God, and I said, to hell with you, God. I'm going to find someone to love me. I wanted to be loved whether I was pretty or ugly, whether I was sick or well, whether I was in a good mood or a bad mood. I wanted someone that would look at me and say, you know what, I love you unconditionally. I said to hell with you, God. I didn't even know that before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 and 5, that God had said to heaven with you, Kay. I went to this party and someone looked at me and said, why don't you quit telling God what you want and tell him that Jesus Christ is all you need? And I thought, you are so rude to talk like that at a party. Jesus Christ is not all I need. I threw my mink over my shoulder, walked out the house. The next morning I got up, it was a Friday, and I thought, I'm sick. I'm sick and there's no cure for my sickness. And I think, honestly, that that's the way so many people feel that are caught especially in sexual sin. Because deep in your heart, if you're a man sleeping with a man, deep in your heart, you know that this is not normal. You can't have sex the normal way that you have with a woman. Deep in your heart, if you're sleeping with someone else's mate, you know, you know deep in your heart, this is not right. Uh, if you're a woman with another woman, you know deep in your heart, it may be meeting a need or that, but deep in your heart, you know, hey, this is not normal. You have to do it some other way to get your kicks because God designed a man and a woman to fit together. Anatomically, he designed it. That's why every sin that a person does is without his body. But those that commit immorality sin against their own body. There on my knees that day, he gave me the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. And God says, come now, come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, yet shall you be as white as snow. And he called her beloved when there was nothing lovely about her. I came to God as this immoral woman on my knees. I said, you can have me. You can do anything you want with me. If you'll give me peace, he gave me the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, and wonder of wonders when I stood up I knew that I was new. I, I felt like a virgin. Pure passion that beats for Christ alone. I was saved that day. I knew, I just knew that I could no longer dress the way I dressed. I knew that I couldn't show off my body anymore. I, I, I knew that, 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 that wherever he went, he was going, wherever I went, he was going with me. No one taught me. No one opened the scriptures. No one was there except me and God. But this is the miracle of redemption, of transformation. Uh, I, I uh, started reading the Bible. Somebody brought me a Phillips translation of the New Testament and, and I would prop it on the steering wheel as I drove to work, and I would read it. And I came across the verse, if any man or woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And I thought, God, you had to put that in the Bible to describe me. And, 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 and then I discovered uh, Romans chapter five, when we were sinners, when we were helpless, I was helpless. I couldn't help myself. I couldn't stop sinning. 
because sin is 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 a it's a slavery that you get into and and uh, so when you were sinners when you were helpless when you were without hope when you were ungodly when you were an enemy of God he saved you that to me is the awesome thing and so the the message and can I fast forward just really fast forward and 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 go all the way to the fact that God brought me to the point where I told him I'd go back to my husband and my husband committed suicide that left me as a widow with two boys then I prayed and said God if you want me to have a husband bring him to me and and People can listen to my testimony later, but, and, and God brought me Jack. Uh, we end up on the mission field. And on the mission field, I'm pregnant with David, uh, our third child. I'm teaching teenagers, and I'm teaching them what I needed to know. I'm teaching them what I did not hear that I did not hear as a man thinks in his heart. I'm teaching them the word of God. I'm teaching them about a holy God, a righteous God, a just God. I'm teaching them about the wages of sin, which is death. I'm teaching them all these things. I'm teaching them about sexual purity. I'm teaching them how to control their thoughts. I'm teaching them, hey, you don't touch a woman. It is written, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Don't light that fire. Keep your hands to yourself. You know, keep yourself pure. And and so I'm teaching them all these things. And one day I'm sitting there in, in the nursery and, and uh, in the bedroom and nursing David. And all of a sudden, I, I'm so sad. And I'm thinking, I'm married twice. And I've battled immoral thoughts. And... Uh, immoral dreams and uh, my boys have had two daddies God where were you when I was a teenager why didn't you send somebody like you've sent me to teach these teenagers and God spoke to my heart and he said this he said I saved you when I wanted to save and if you'll quit moaning and groaning about your past and you'll share it, I'll use it. And later on, I came across a verse in Galatians 1. Paul's giving us testimony. Paul calls himself the chief of sinners. He says it is a trustworthy statement that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. And so Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, when it pleased God to reveal his son in me. And I thought, God, there it is. The proof that what I heard in my heart and my mind was truly measurable as truth by the word of God. You saved me when you wanted to save me. You're the redeemer. You say all things keep on working together for good to those that love God, to those that are the called according to his purpose, for whom God foreknew. When did God call me? When did God know I was going to be saved? Ephesians 1, he chose me in Christ before the foundation of the world. When did I get saved? I didn't get saved until I was 29. But God saved me then. Because, and if he saved me then, and he knew I was going to get saved, then all things, even my wretched, horrible past, God will use to minister to others. And when I saw that, when I saw that my sexual brokenness, that my sexual sin, that, that, that all that I did and got involved in was, was, was redeemable by God then in a sense, I was set free. And I have people come up to me all the time and say, I always thought that I'd have to sit on the back row of the church, that God would never use me like he's used you. And now I know 
God can use anybody. He's the Redeemer. Your passion that beats for Christ alone. How many Bibles do you have? One, two, ten, twenty? It's the Word of God, and I hope you're reading them. Whether it be two or twenty, sometimes it's great to have a book that collects the cumulative wisdom from the Bible on a particular subject. Kay Arthur has done just that. In her book, The Truth About Sex, Kay has collected just about every scripture imaginable on the topic of sex and brought them together in a thorough Bible-centered collection about the mind of God on human sexual expression. For that reason, this is possibly the best book ever written outside the Bible on the topic of sex, why God created it, how He ordered it to be expressed, and how He redeems it when it gets broken or damaged. If you get only one book on what the Bible says about sex, this should be the one. Then check your stack of Bibles to see if what she has written isn't true. Kay Arthur is known for her fidelity to the biblical text, and you are going to treasure this contribution to the subject. To get your copy of The Truth About Sex, simply go to purepassion.us. That's purepassion.us. When you know that your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you know that, and you know, hey, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. As Paul wrote, it is a trustworthy statement, worthy of all acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners. He saves sinners, but he breaks the power of sin. Salvation is not only getting forgiveness of sins so that you don't pay the penalty of sin, but it is the breaking of the power of sin. And someday, freedom from the presence of sin because we will dwell in the new Jerusalem forever and ever and ever. God will wipe away all of our tears. Nothing unclean will ever come into it. And we will be there. We who were unclean, who have been made clean by a holy God so that we could be a holy people. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace is unmerited favor. It's something that you can't earn, never pay for. And he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace was not poured out on me in vain. That lavish, extravagant grace of God was not poured out on me in vain. But I labored more than them all, speaking of other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me. People will often say to me, it must be hard for you to share yourself, to be so vulnerable. It really isn't. Because I really really know God. And I know God because I've studied the Word of God. You meet God in the Old Testament. That's where you're introduced to to this righteous, holy, long-suffering, compassionate God. Yes, a God of justice. Yes, a God of righteousness. But a God whose mercies are new every morning, whose compassions fail not. And once you go to Him, and if you're all right with God, you're all right with others. I mean, in Romans 8, He says, if God's for us, who can be against us? Would it be Jesus? Oh, no. He died for me. When did He die for me? He died for me when I was a sinner. You know, I love Jeremiah. Jeremiah is bringing the message, and it's a message for today, to a nation that is so corrupt. And God is going to have to judge them. And yet what he keeps saying is, you've forsaken me. Return. 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 Jeremiah cries out, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, O God, and I will be saved. And Jeremiah looks at these broken people. And he says, for the brokenness of the daughter of my people, I mourn. Dismay has taken over me. He says, is there no balm in Gilead? 
Is there no great physician there? What he's saying is, yes, there is a balm in Gilead. There is a healing balm. It's the word of God. Psalm 107 verse 20 says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no great physician there? God's name is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord God that heals. What does the Bible say about God's intention for human sexuality? Well, God's omniscience makes everything He does to be filled with purpose and intent. Genesis 1 and 2 make it crystal clear. We were created in God's image, male and female. Eve was then taken out of Adam's side, and for this reason, the two must become one flesh again. That is a call to heterosexual monogamy. Jesus reiterated this command in Matthew 19, emphasizing that the two had become one. God condemns every departure from this model for what it does to society, our bodies, and His image in us. Physical sexuality is a human enactment of a greater spiritual reality, that of Christ and His church, the bridegroom and the bride. Satan wants not only the image of God in our sexuality marred, he also wants this picture of Christ and His bride marred. The sexual act in marriage is to be as much a spiritual act as it is to be a physical one. This is why the enemy bombards our minds with degraded sex and relegates it to darkness, where God is denied and ignored. In faithful monogamous marital relations, we are ingraining the pattern of intimate faithfulness into our minds and hearts and setting it as an example for the world to follow. How many Bibles do you have? One, two, ten, twenty? It's the Word of God and I hope you're reading them. Whether it be two or twenty, sometimes it's great to have a book that collects the cumulative wisdom from the Bible on a particular subject. Kay Arthur has done just that. In her book, The Truth About Sex, Kay has collected just about every scripture imaginable on the topic of sex and brought them together in a thorough Bible-centered collection about the mind of God on human sexual expression. For that reason, this is possibly the best book ever written outside the Bible on the topic of sex, why God created it, how He ordered it to be expressed, and how He redeems it when it gets broken or damaged. If you get only one book on what the Bible says about sex, this should be the one. Then check your stack of Bibles to see if what she has written isn't true. Kay Arthur is known for her fidelity to the biblical text, and you are going to treasure this contribution to the subject. To get your copy of The Truth About Sex, simply go to purepassion.us. That's purepassion.us. May I talk to you for just a moment, woman to woman, or woman to man. We live in a society where over one-third of all women have been sexually abused. They've been used for the deviant pleasure of other men, just for their sexual gratification. They've had to do terrible things. They've been asked to do terrible things. And yet, because our body is our body, that even though sometimes it's terrible, there is a pleasure in it. And so then on top of that, you begin to feel a guilt. I remember a gal when I was teaching, I have written a book called Lord Heal My Hurts. And I was teaching this at a conference. And afterwards, this girl came barreling down the aisle. Her hair was greasy. Her clothes were uh, unkept. She was very, very heavy. And she looked at me and she said, I can not forgive. I will not forgive. And I said, oh, honey, come and tell me what happened. And then she told me about her father and how he sexually abused her and how she got pregnant and he got her the baby aborted and he did it once, he did it twice. The third time they had a baby and it was deformed. And the baby died. And she said, I am so hurt. I said, you know what? I am so angry at your father. She looked at me 
She said, what did you say? I said, I am so angry at your father. And I want you to know, God is angry. The Bible talks about God being angry far more than he talks about man being angry. Sin angers God. Sin that is done to you or sin that you commit angers God. And yet he is the Redeemer. You say, if God was God, then why didn't he rescue me? You know what, precious one? I don't know. I don't know. But I know this. He's rescuing you right now. He's telling you that because he is God, he can take that wretched past and he can make it work together for good. He's telling you that you can have a brand new beginning. He's telling you that you can start with Jesus Christ. Coming to him and saying to him, I'm unclean, I'm a sinner, I've walked my way, I was abused, I abused, I was misused, I turned to another woman because of what men had done to me. Whichever sex you are, God looks at you and he says, I'm the redeemer. This is a trustworthy statement. I've come to save you. And I promise you now that if you'll come to me and you'll believe that Jesus died for your sins and you'll receive him, I'll be your Lord. I'll be your God. And my Father will be your Father. And I'll forgive all your sins and I'll make you a brand new creature. If you'll get into my word, I'll heal you. It's the balm of Gilead. And I'll heal you. And I will restore you. And you know what? I will use you. I'll use you to help others. Your pain and your suffering and your sin and your wretchedness and your even deviancy will not be wasted. I'll redeem it if you'll just come to me. That girl that came barreling down that aisle talked to me. I explained to her that God would deal with her father because, I mean, she was put in an institution and everything. I mean, he called her a slut. He called her a whore. I mean, he called her everything. He accused her. And I said, but if you'll let go of that bitterness, if you'll forgive him, I promise you, God will heal you. God healed her. A year or so later, I looked down. I was teaching at that Precept Ministries International in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We purposely kept our auditorium small so that we can have one-on-one. -on -one. And I thought, I know that girl. I think I know that girl. So we got down close enough to see her name tag, and I nearly died. No more stringy, greasy hair, no more dirty clothes, no more, in a sense, gloppy fat. This was a woman that was absolutely transformed. I put my arms around her, just cuddled her close, and she told me the story of how God healed her brokenness, of how she got into the Word of God, how she grew, and now, how she was married. And oh, what a marriage God has given her. He absolutely adores her. Now, before she met that man, she met another man. She wrote me about him. And uh, she said, should I tell him? And I said, yes, honey, I think you should tell him about your past because it can affect your relationship in, in the bedroom until you get used to one another. She told him, and he looked at her, and he says, I don't want someone that's been used by you. 
and he walked away. And I said, I'm so glad you told him. He really didn't love you. I want you to know, precious one, that there is a man that will never walk away from you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you so that you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. He loves you with an everlasting love. And listen carefully, with loving kindness, he's drawn you to himself when it pleases him. So what do you do with the past? Well, that's a whole nother story. But what you do with the past is summarized in Philippians chapter three, forgetting those things that are behind. I press forward towards the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Listen to me, don't let your past cripple you. You can't change it, you can't do anything about it. But your Redeemer says, He will redeem it and use it. So He's going to use you and use even that pain, even that suffering, to make you more like Jesus and to give you a very fruitful and purposeful life. He causes all things to keep on working together for good. He does not say they're good, but He causes them to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose, for whom He foreknew, that's you, He predestined, He marked out beforehand for you to become conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. You know what? Jesus learned obedience through the things which He suffered. So He's touched with the feeling of your sufferings, of your infirmities, but He'll heal them and He'll use them. All you have to do is say, God, I want you to be my Father. I want Jesus to be my Savior. And I want the Holy Spirit to live inside of me and let my body be His temple. And then God, I want everything in this temple to say holy to you. Holy means you're no longer common. You're set aside for a divine purpose, God's purpose. Following you to where the light is. Got the steps I'm